My name is uh, Pastor Aaron Rosario, and I'm the youth pastor here at Experience Church. Uh, so, hey, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we, we have, I, I just kind of wanted to share a couple things quickly. We have over 50 students that are serving here today between parking lot to platform, production, all kinds of stuff. Uh, they were so eager and so excited to jump in. I was, my, my phone was blowing up for like the last two weeks. Like, hey, where can I serve? What am I doing? Hey, I haven't heard back yet. I'm like, hold on, we'll get you assignments. So even last night, I got people texting me and this morning, but our next gen was so excited to jump in and serve today to put their gifts and their talents to use uh, and, and to be able to serve in the house of God. How incredible is that, right? They're like, I want to serve in the house of God. And, uh, and just quickly, I, I want to just honor uh, Pastor Kyle and Pastor Justina, our lead pastors here, because uh, I, it's such a privilege to be able to serve in this house, um, but to, to have leaders who, who are like, you know what, we, we value the next generation. We're going to pour into them. We're going to be intentional. We're going to give them opportunities to lead and grow. Um, and, and, and I just want to just real quickly just honor Pastor Kyle and Pastor Justina. Thank you so much for your leadership. We're grateful for our pastors here, and uh, we're, we're just so grateful for an opportunity to put youth behind the steering wheel and uh, just say, like, hey, let's go for it. Let's see what happens, like, right? Let's go for it. Hey, uh, the title of the message today is Set Apart, Not Made for Ordinary Use. The title of the message is being set apart uh, because we are not made for ordinary use. And um, I want to just kind of... Uh, a jump, as we're jumping in here today, there was, um, you know, this, this message has been something that's been stirring, that God's been stirring in me for quite some time. And, and I love the topic of, of being like set apart or consecrated, sanctified. So there's, there's this Hebrew word, um, kadash. Kadash is, it simply means that, sanctify, consecrate, set apart. And, and I love this word because it's, it's just saying like, hey, God has called us to be set apart for his use. Like it's not for the world's use or anything else, but, but I've set you apart because I have purpose inside of you. I have destiny inside of you. I have a mission for you to fulfill something that only you can fulfill with my, my empowerment, with my spirit, with my presence going before you. It's something that only he can accomplish. Uh, and, and I love this idea, but I want to take us in as we're, as we're diving into the main text to Exodus chapter 19, verses 9 through 14. And we're going to see this word in here. But the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the people, uh, or Moses told the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them. That Kadash word, consecrate them, set them apart. Set them apart and set them aside for holy use uh, today and tomorrow. And have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day. Because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Now put limits uh, for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful, do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. They are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Now I promise the message is gonna get encouraging and uplifting. Uh, I, I promise there's gonna be a turn, but not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast may they approach the mountain. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people and he consecrated them, he set them apart and they washed their clothes. And I love thinking about this, this topic and this idea of, of being set apart, of not being made for ordinary use, of being set apart for a specific reason and purpose. And, and when I think about this, I oftentimes, because I love food, uh, I, I think about dinner. I think about dinner when I think about consecration. And have you ever gone over, like you've gone to either a fancy restaurant or you went over to somebody's house and, and you get there and there's this plate and there's just this whole mess of silverware on the right side. But then you look on the left and there's a bunch of silverware over there too, right? Like, like there's multiple forks, multiple spoons, sometimes even multiple knives. And, and you're like, okay, what, what does all this stuff do? Am I supposed to play these spoons on my knees? Like, what am I supposed to do with them? And there's all of this stuff. And, and I think about that in maybe one of those, one of those spoons is like, it's the soup spoon and you use it 
for soup. And then another spoon is like, okay, you use this maybe with the main course and, and maybe you have like a salad fork and, and you got a, a knife on the table that's just meant for putting butter on bread. Who would have thought there's one knife for butter on bread? And then there's another knife that's like, hey, if you're cutting a steak or if you're cutting some meat, like you use this knife, everything is consecrated or set apart for a specific reason. For a specific purpose, and you can use the butter knife to try and cut your steak, but it's probably not going to work because that's not what it was created for. And I love thinking about this idea because on our lives, we're, we're not intended to look like the world. We're not intended to follow the, the sway and the schemes of the enemy. And we're, we're not even created for our own use, but God is saying, I've set you aside and I've set you apart for my use. I've set you apart for a holy purpose. And I love thinking about this. And from this main text, um, you know, I, I want to I wanna take us into the, there's two, two battles, I feel like, and two tensions that I feel like the enemy wants us to feel. And, and these are, are things that like come up in our lives and in different seasons and things. But there's, there's just simply two battles that I, I want us to, to talk about and dive into today. And the first one would be this, the, the first battle or tension of isolate versus consecrate. This, this first tension of, of isolation versus consecration, isolate versus consecrate. And at face value, sometimes they can kind of start off looking similar, but, but then they very suddenly and very quickly take two different directions. And, and, and I know that in my life, the, the enemy has wanted to at times, because I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I don't get frustrated by, like if somebody's like calling me names or doing something crazy, like harsh like that, like it doesn't really bother me. It doesn't really get under my skin. I'm just like, okay, cool. Uh, but then if I like would take the keys out of my pocket and I'm going to the car and I drop the keys, oh my goodness, that is the worst thing that could possibly happen to me. It's the little things that set me off. And I'm like, seriously, like I have five fingers, I have a whole hand that knows how to hold keys and I dropped them. Like it makes no sense. But the worst thing is if I go down to pick up the keys and I drop them again on the way back up, oh my goodness, you would think that like, you know, something terrible just happened. Like that is the worst for me. And, and in moments like that, like I, I find myself where, where my, my attitude and things start to change. And then uh, Marissa, my wife might be like, Hey, I'm like talking to me about something and I'm in a bad mood. And she She's like, what's wrong? I'm like, I dropped the keys twice. Not just once, I dropped it twice. Like, are you kidding me? Who does that? You know, and she's like, okay, like let's, let's move past it. Let's get on. Like, it's not a big deal. But, but there can often be these things and, and I, I kind of joke, but, but seriously, that does set me over the edge. But, um, but you know, I, I find myself sometimes and I have in the past where, where the enemy likes to work on this, this tactic of I'm gonna isolate you. And, and, and I don't know if you're anything like me, but there have been times where I'm just, I woke up and it's just not a good day. Like for whatever reason, I'm just not in a great mood and, and, and I don't really feel like talking or, or whatever it is, but, but like slowly and surely the enemy tries to, in moments like that, just say like, you know what, I, I think you just need to like be on your own. Like you just need to disconnect from everybody. Like don't talk to people, just kind of like hang out and chill on your own. Like then you can work it out and you'll be better and then you'll come back even stronger. But, but I found a lot of times what the enemy does is in those moments, he, he wants to take me into this state to, of, 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 hey, you need to go back and you just need to isolate. And, and these are the moments where when things didn't quite go the way we thought with that job. Or, or maybe when, when, you know what, like everything was fine and then my, my vehicle broke down again, right? <laughs> like everything, everything's going like out of nowhere, things just started to seem like they're getting chaotic. And, and what happens in those moments, if we're not careful, the enemy can try to convince us into, you know what, like it's just a really hard and busy season of life. Like maybe you should just pull back from serving. Maybe you should like just take a Sunday off and just sleep in and just rest, like stay on your own. And in, in some of these moments, like, yes, you, you serve on a team, but, but maybe just take another couple months, take the rotation off, like just, just get back on your own and, and maybe you can get your bearings, you know, back in order. But, but I found it in moments like that, it, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. 
that I find like in moments where I'm like, you know what, I'm just in a little bit of a, a mess and a little bit of a fog uh, that I come in and maybe I'm like, hey, I just saw somebody like, hey, it's, it's good to see you and in passing and then they kind of go on and then I'm like, I get my own headspace. Anybody else like, okay, well, they just said it was good to see me. They didn't say it was great to see me. So maybe it really wasn't that good to see me. Maybe I'm not a good person. They think I'm not a good person. I can't do anything right. Like what's going on? And before I know it, I, I find myself spiraling down this staircase and I'm like, how did I even get here in this mess? And the enemy wants to, to isolate us. He wants to keep you in isolation because he knows if, if they get around the family of God, if they get into, into God's house, like I, I know that they'll be encouraged. I know that where they're at right now, they're not gonna feel that way anymore and heavy. I know that they're gonna be encouraged and they're gonna find hope and they're gonna find freedom. But if I can just keep them isolated, then they won't be able to go down that path. And it's this tension that, that the enemy wants to, to bring in where at first it's like, you know what, I, it, it seems like I'm just kind of taking a step back and it might seem like wisdom, but, but then if, if unchecked, the enemy can take us into a place where we're just completely cut off and isolated from the community that God has tried to place us in. To continue helping us go forward, to continue helping us advance. And, and, and I, I remember, you know, in, uh, even in, in a time where, where you know, God, God wants to bring us, instead of isolation, he wants to bring us into this consecration. He wants to bring us into this place where it's not just like, yep, I'm getting away from everybody else. But no, I, I'm, I'm set apart for a specific reason and for a specific purpose. Like I, I don't do what the world does and I, I don't do maybe what the, what the enemy wants me to do. And I'm not made for my own use, but, but I, I've set you apart for something and I have something in store for you. And I remember when I was in school, uh, down in ministry school, I remember there was an instructor that was, was, was he, he went through and he preached a message and afterwards it was just like a, a thought that he threw out there. It wasn't in his message, but it was just something he's like, hey, I don't even know why I'm saying this, but he's like, for some of you, there are going to be things that people do in the world around you. And he's like, and it might be okay for them to do, but, but for whatever reason, God's saying that's not okay for you. Like it might be okay for them, but it's just not something that I've called you to engage in. And, and, and sometimes we can, we can look at the world and, and see what they're doing and, and how they're acting. And, and the Lord's just got this reserve inside of you saying, but you were made for so much more. Like, like yes, you could do that. You could make that decision, but, but I'm telling you, it, it's only gonna slow you down from the purpose and the freedom that I have for you because you're consecrated, you're set apart. You're not made for ordinary use. And I remember this instructor was, was talking about this and he's like, you know, there are gonna be times where, where your friends go to do something and you're just gonna have to say no because the Lord wants to, to download something. He wants to minister something to you. And, and I remember I had a, a few friends that were in school and it was in the, the heat of a, a wild semester where we got all kinds of homework and things. And, and we were like, hey, let's just have like a break night. Let's go watch a movie. We'll go out to eat beforehand, watch a movie. We didn't have much money. So this was like, this is the one thing we're gonna do this month or maybe this quarter, like this semester. This is the one thing we're gonna do. And I was so excited. And I sent a message. I'm like, yes, I'm in. Let's go. And, and I remember the Lord starting to like stir something in me, like, don't go, don't go tonight. And my first thought was, well, it's not dangerous. We're not doing anything wrong. We're watching a clean movie and we're going to eat. Like it might even be like something like Red Lobster or something. I don't know. I'm like, I don't know, but it's going to be great. I know it is. And, and I just couldn't shake this feeling where the Lord was just saying, don't go. I, I want you to stay. Don't go. And I remember afterwards, like nothing crazy happened. Like there weren't any car accidents, nothing bad happened. But, but I'll never forget that moment because it was a marking moment in my faith. And I remember I got alone with the Lord and I was just in my room because nobody else was around. You know, I was the only one here. And so I'm in my room and I, I put on some worship music that I knew that in this season, this has been my worship song that I just feel like God shows up when I, when I worship to this song. And when I put it on, and so I got into the scriptures and I started reading and I started praying. And, and before I knew it, minutes turned to an hour, an hour and a half. And I'm just on the floor and I was weeping, literally just weeping in the presence of God. His presence had showed up and, and, and all of a sudden, like I pulled my journal out and I just, I couldn't stop writing fast enough because I just felt like God was downloading things and he was opening up scripture to me. And I just started writing it down, but but I remember in that moment, my instructor saying, sometimes there are gonna be things that you just have to say no to. Not because it's necessarily bad, but because God has something else in store for you. 
And I'll never forget that moment because some of the even revelation of things that we're talking about here today are, are moments that I've had years ago in the presence of God, just saying, yes, I'll say yes to consecration. I'll say yes to just being set apart. And, and so I, I want to read a scripture here as we go back in time before we're finding out where the main text, God is talking to Moses on the mountain, the Israelites are there. We're going to go back and rewind to find out how did it all start and how did they come out of Egypt, like all of those things. So in Exodus chapter three, verses one through 12, I'll read through this pretty quickly, but it says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange sight. Why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush and he said, Moses, Moses. Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. That's a mouthful, guys. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this is the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. In this moment, like Moses had grown up in Egypt and he, he faced a situation where he fled Egypt and he left and he was running for his life. He was scared out of fear because something had happened. And so he's like, I'm running away. And the enemy meant to isolate Moses and just kind of put him in a wilderness. Like, I'm just gonna separate you and put you all by yourself so that you can't reach the purpose and the destiny that God has for your life. If I can just cut you off from everything you've ever known, not just Egypt, but also the people of God. If I can cut you off, maybe you won't fulfill the purpose that God has for your life. And he goes into like isolation. But I love that even in the midst of our isolation, God can reach us, right? That God can reach us even in the midst of what we're going through and what seems insurmountable and what seems like, I don't even want to show my face again because I don't know what people are going to think. I don't know what people are going to say, but God has more because he set you apart. You're not made for ordinary use. You're not made for the enemy's use. You're not made for the world's use. You're set apart for a specific use. And, and I love in, in this whole uh, mess that seems to be going on is all of a sudden God meets with Moses and he tells him, you know, basically like you had fled because of fear, but you know what? I'm going to empower you and you're going back in because you're going to bring other people out with you. And, and I love that, that Moses is like, he, he's coming to this place where I, I, I'm hiding my face in reverence because this is like the God of the universe, I, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Like I revere him. There, there is a holy fear here. And, and, and he's like, in this moment, he receives a message from the Lord that you're consecrated, you're set apart. And, and just to show you that I'm with you, when you and all of the Israelites come and meet back on this mountain, you'll know that I'm your God and that I'm with you and that I sent you. You know, and, and just a, a, another example of, of consecration, I, I um, you know, when we, when we think about this, this word that was Kadash, it's, it's talking about being consecrated or sanctified and set apart and uh, I don't know about you guys. I'm sure we've all been there at some point in some way, shape or form. But have you ever had a place where you had to like uh, a shared space where you put your food or you store your food with maybe like a roommate, uh, maybe other students or, or something along those lines or at a workplace. Now we're getting really real, right? In the workplace, you got to put your food in the fridge and you just got to trust that nobody's going to take your stuff, right? I've been on the maybe 
stealing and uh, my food got stolen. I didn't steal it, but my food's getting stolen before. And I was like, oh my goodness, like I should have done something about that, you know? And we have a, a refrigerator here, you know, at the church. And, uh, you know, we sometimes store our stuff here, but we might have, uh, you know, like Adam's lunch here. And uh, we, I think this one, actually, this, let me see this one right here. I think this one is Pastor Kyle's. Guys, y'all want to see what he's got in here? <laughs> don't tell him. Like, I know he's right there, but still, don't tell him. <laughs> you know, he's got like, you go in and it's, it's marked, but yo, look at this. It's like a cookie dough cupcake. Like, you don't want nobody to steal your lunch, so you put your name on it, and I think he'll, oh my God, I think he'll forgive me, okay? <laughs> um, I promise I'm not that guy, but cookie dough, come on, somebody. Oh man, that's good, PK. Where'd you get that? <laughs> but if you don't want somebody to take your stuff because it's not for their use, what do you do? You, you put your name on it, right? You, you gotta put your name on it so that nobody steals it and they know that, hey, this isn't for Pastor Kyle's use, even though I probably owe him now because of that cupcake. But they know it's, it's not for their use. It's not for your use, it's, it's for my use. It's mine. And what you do is you, you consecrate or you sanctify your food and you set it apart. And everybody said, amen, right? Nobody's touching my food. But what happens is, in the same way God has written his name on you, that, that through the blood of the lamb and the sacrifice of Jesus, God has written his name on you. And he said, this is not for the enemy's use, this is not for the world's use. It's not even for your own use. I've set you apart. I've consecrated you, sanctified you, and you're not made for ordinary use anymore. I have a plan and I have a purpose. We're sanctified and set apart. And in this moment, he's setting Moses apart and saying, you know what? I know where you've been because we've, we've all been in some places that maybe we never intended to be. Or, or maybe we, we have found ourselves in places that we full well intended to be, but we came to realize that this really wasn't the answer. I was seeking something as a fulfillment, but I didn't find it. And in these moments, it can be difficult because how do I undo what I've already done? What's so heavy and weighing on me? How do I undo? I can't. I can't take it back. But the good news is that when we run to Jesus, like these things can be dealt with. And we simply just say, yes, I want to walk in consecration. I want to walk in that path. I want to be set apart, not for anything, not for any use, except for what you have for me, God. And the, the second tension that I feel like the enemy wants to portray, that it's not really a battle between the enemy and the Lord. Like the Lord has already won. He wins every time. Like he's never lost a battle. He's never going to lose a battle, but the enemy portrays it as this battle and this tension of who's going to win. Am I going to win or is God going to win in your life? And the second tension that I, I feel like the Lord or, or that the, the enemy can bring in, but the Lord really already has the victory in is the, the tension or the battle of intimidate versus concentrate. The tension or the battle of intimidate versus concentrate. And, and this is a place where I want to jump into Exodus chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. And it says, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he was not willing to let them go, the Israelites. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure you do not appear before me again. The day you see my face, you will die. It sounds a lot like intimidation. Just as you say, Moses replied, I will never appear before you again. And interestingly enough, there's been many plagues that have already come upon Egypt because Pharaoh wouldn't let the people of God go. And, and so, so Moses finds himself, the last time I'm interacting with Moses face to face, he still is saying no, and there's still a couple more plagues that are gonna happen. But in this moment, I, I remember and I reflect back to the first time that Moses left Egypt. He ran out of fear for his life. He ran out of fear. But, but this time, he had received a word from God. 
because he was like, you know what? I'm not going to isolate anymore. I'm going to allow the Lord to consecrate me, set me apart, not for ordinary use. I'm going to allow him to do a work and commission me back into the mess that he pulled me out of. I'm going to allow him to empower me to go bring more people out. And so what he does is he comes in and Pharaoh's trying to intimidate him. And, and I don't know about any of us out here, but there, there have been times where I've, I've fallen into some of these traps and some of these snares of, of being intimidated and maybe I'm, I'm just, I'm not good enough because I don't look the part because I, I don't fit in or I don't seem to have the abilities. I don't, I don't seem to have what it takes. I don't, I'm not qualified. Like, I just don't feel, like I feel like I'm undervalued and I feel intimidated at the thought or the sight of, of any type of maybe leadership or advancement. Like, I just feel like I'm paralyzed right where I'm at because there have been so many things that have gripped me for so long. I just don't feel like I can move forward. I don't know if anybody else has felt tensions like that, but I know that, that I have and, and I, I know that, that I, I had struggled for so many years with, with uh, you know, just poor self-esteem and, and just struggled with anxious thoughts and, and, and depression. I had struggled with so many of these things because I had a fear of man inside of me and I, I didn't have just a fear of the Lord. I cared what, what people thought and I was worried about, about being used for what the world said was right. And I, I had a fear of not being accepted and Maybe you've even been in places where you're like, you know what, I, I thought that maybe the, this relationship or this friendship or whatever, I thought that this was going to last and I thought that this was going to be stable and you find yourself on the crumbling end of what you thought was going to be something more, of what you thought was going to be constant or maybe you found yourself in other areas but, but the enemy has tried to intimidate you and say you're not valuable, you're not worth anything. You, your worth is kind of dwindling but... But this is the enemy trying to intimidate us and keep us stuck and paralyzed so that we can't move forward because I just, I can't see past. No matter what people say, no matter what I feel like, people are even encouraging me from, from the word of God. Like, I just can't see past this intimidation mountain. It, it just doesn't seem doable. It doesn't seem doable for me. And, and I know that the, the enemy would want to portray that this mountain could never be moved, but the other side of this is that the Lord is calling us to concentrate. That, that he's saying, yes, the, the intimidation may come and some of the fear and anxious things may come, but, but I'm just asking you to concentrate on what I said, on the word of God that is not shaken, but it stands forever, from everlasting to everlasting. He's like, I just need you to stand and concentrate on my word because things will come. But if you just stay focused on me, I promise that if I've gotten you to this point, I'll get you through the next season of your life. And so if you would just concentrate, take your eyes off of the things around you and just put them right here. Because if God said it, it will happen. He's saying, I, I just simply need you to move from this intimidate stage to, to the concentrate stage. That you're being set apart and I, I need you to just trust. And what Moses, what happens with Moses is that, you know, Pharaoh is trying to intimidate him, but he's like, you know what? This time I can leave Egypt full of faith. I was full of fear last time, but this time I can leave full of faith because God said, and in Exodus chapter 13, we're not going to read this one, but what happens is um, as, as Pharaoh releases the people of God, like what happens is he's like, okay, yep, you can go and all these plagues are broken out. But he's like, what, what God is, is kind of saying in chapter 13 is I could have led them through the Philistine country and I could have led them right over here down this path. But he was saying if I was nervous that if when they got there, that they, at the site of war, the site of battle, that they, they may end up going straight back to Egypt. Like God is saying, I, I provided a clear pathway out for them. And as they're walking on the path, if they face some adversity that seems overwhelming and that seems tough and difficult, if I take them this way, they might get intimidated and they might go straight back to the bondage and the slavery that they were living in. And God was, God was saying, no, I have better plans for them. Because we know that God doesn't just want to get us out of the sinful situations, but he also wants to get the sin out of us. So he's like, you know what? I'm going to take them this way. I'm going to take them to the Red Sea. 
And what happens is they come to the Red Sea and, and God is like, they're the Egyptian armies coming after him to overtake them, to overthrow them. And, and they're on the verge of the Red Sea. They're like, what are we going to do? And God parts the sea for them. That, that when we don't think that anything else can be done because we can't do it on our own strength, that's when God does his best work. That's when God does his best work. When we say, God, I'm not leaning on my own abilities or, or my own strength anymore, but I, I just have to put my trust in you because I know that I can't do it on my own. I have to put my trust in you. And what happens is the Red Sea splits and the Israelites go walking through the sea on dry ground. And the Egyptians were coming after them and, and their bondage, their past, their slavery, the, the things that they weren't proud of, the things that maybe they were born into and they had no say over, but it was just always that way. And I thought it was always going to be that way. All of a sudden, those things are trying to creep back up. And, and, and once they cross through the Israelites, the Egyptians go in and the sea just swallows up Egypt. It swallows up the Egyptians, the past, the slavery, because God, again, he doesn't just want to get us out of our sin, but he wants to get the sin out of us and not leave a pathway back. He's saying, I'm not, I'm not taking you on a path that you can just go straight back into it. No, I'm taking you through somewhere and I'm delivering you in a way that only I can do so that there's no pathway back. There's no even potential that you could go back. He's saying, I want to take you through this process of sanctification, of being set apart each day. One step by one step through this sanctification process because he's intended freedom for us. And in Galatians 5, chapter 1, it says this. It says that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He's saying, I've, I've provided a pathway of freedom through the Red Sea for you. So that you couldn't just, at the first sight of, of intimidation, that you, you could just go running back to Egypt, back to the past, back to the bondage. But he's saying, no, I, I, I'm going to cover up those paths. And I'm going to do a work inside of you that you couldn't believe could possibly be done. Because I, I have never intended slavery for you. I, I've never intended bondage for you because you're set apart. You're not made for ordinary use. You're not made for, for the world's use. You're not made for the enemy's use. But I have something special for you. I have a plan and I have purpose on you. And I don't just want to get it to you, but I do want to get it through you. Because what happens is when God sets us free, it's like, it's like he, he puts the, the key in the lock and he undoes the shackles and it's like, oh my goodness, this feels amazing. Like, I never thought I could be this free. I never thought life could feel this good the way it does right now. I never thought it was possible for me. And then after that moment, he's like, but, but it's not just enough to stay there. Like, I didn't intend it just for you. I, I intended it for a remnant. I intended it for more sons and more daughters that may be struggling with the same things that you struggled with. And, and, and the Lord's saying, you, you might not own the keys, but, but I can lend them to you because you know the one who can set them free. So if you would just bring them back to the feet of Jesus, I could set them free too because he's not just intended for us to keep this salvation to keep this freedom to keep free from this bondage but he's like I want you to go and share it with the world around you that when you feel intimidated when life and the world seems to throw intimidation at you that you can say no I, I reject that and, and I'm going to concentrate on the word that God has given to me and if if you if you don't feel like God has given you a word well I mean just like we read, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. God set you free so that you wouldn't have to live in bondage. Maybe that's your word. Maybe you're like, I don't know. I, and I don't feel like the Lord has really spoken something to me that I can hold on to. But we're just here to remind you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. When you don't feel like it, when it doesn't seem like it, it's holding on to a word and, and I'm not going to surrender to intimidation, but I'm just going to concentrate on the word of God. 
And in Exodus chapter 14, verse 13, Moses answered the people. He says, do not be afraid. Stand firm. You will see the deliverance that the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. This is what Moses was talking about with God on the edge of the Red Sea. He's saying, as I create a pathway for you out, I'm going to so change the past. I'm going to so change your past that people don't even recognize you because you don't even look the same. That yeah, yeah, maybe things used to be one way and I, I used to live in slavery and I used to live in bondage and I had a messy past, but God so removed that from me. That's not who I am. He has set me apart and I'm not made for ordinary use. I was made for so much more. And guys, we're not perfect. We're just forgiven. We're not perfect. We're just forgiven and living a life when I'm trying to be perfect, it's like I'm walking on eggshells because I can't. I have to make sure I keep everything straight. But when I realize that I'm just forgiven, I can say, God, I know that it was all you. I know that it has nothing to do with me. I've just surrendered my life. I've surrendered my heart, but it has everything to do with you. So I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to set myself apart. And I'm going to concentrate on the word that you've spoken. And if you haven't received a word yet, the encouragement is just, dig into your Bible. Choose, choose any, any place that you want. I know that the Lord will speak to you and give you a word. Maybe it's just one verse. I'm standing on this verse. But the Lord will continue to remind you of that and use it to continue to get you through to where he's desired you to go. And closing here in Exodus chapter 19, we're going to read verses 10 and 14 again. But it says that, in verse 10, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. And then in verse 14, it says, after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. What happened was God delivered them out of Egypt. He, he had an encounter with Moses. Then Moses goes in, he delivers the people out. And then Moses finds himself back on the mountain, just like God had said. He said, this is going to be your sign that when you bring the people out of Egypt, you're going to bring them here and we're going to worship on this mountain together. And so he's saying, now that I've brought you out of the sin, out of the bondage, now let me just set you apart. Now that you've surrendered completely, let me set you apart. Would you guys pray with me this morning? Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for for pulling us out, for rescuing us. And we just declare that, that we want to be lives that are surrendered, that are set apart because we, we understand that we're not made for ordinary use. We understand that we were made and created to serve you and worship you. And Father, we, we're committed to just sharing the truth about who Jesus is, about who you are, Father, with your sons and your daughters that maybe have not found you quite yet encouraging others around us so that they can keep walking another day. And as we continue praying, if you're in this place and you're like, you know what, I, I hear the message and, and maybe it's, it's stirring me a little bit, but I haven't even taken the first step of, of accepting Jesus as, as Lord and Savior in my heart. If, if you're in this place and you're like, I've never committed my life to Jesus, but, but I feel him, I hear him calling and I feel him tugging on my heartstrings today. If that's you in this place and you're like, I want to make a decision for Jesus, it's the best decision we could ever make. If you're in this place and you're like, that's me, I want you to pray with me and for me. I just want you to raise your hand right where you're at. You're saying, I'm making a decision for Jesus. I want to put him first. I want to be able to consecrate and concentrate on the word of God, but I just first need to make a decision. If that's you, just raise your hand so we know who we're praying with and for. Awesome. I want you to pray this in your heart after me. Say, Father, I thank you for who you are. And I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins. That he was, he was buried in a grave and he rose again on the third day. I believe that he's seated in heavenly places and that I'm now seated with him. So Jesus, change my heart. Renew me. Restore me. and Show me how to live. My life is yours. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen.